So I'm going to start off uh, talking about uh, deep learning technology, try to give you guys an overview and dive into some of the technology trends that, uh, that we're seeing, and then um, talk a little bit about where uh, deep learning is in the data center, in automotive, at the edge, um, and then uh, wrap up. So just uh, very basic uh, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar uh, with the deep learning, uh, deep neural networks. The uh, networks uh, are used uh, today, have a, a lot of layers, typically dozens of layers, hundreds of layers in some cases with thousands and thousands of nodes in each layer. So the diagram here shows a very simple uh, neural network, but of course the ones that uh, are being used today are much more complicated. Uh, each of these nodes are connected, and then the, each connection has a certain weighting value uh, that's applied. And um, so those uh, weights are then typically used in a multiply accumulate operation to calculate the output of each node, which means that typical neural network has to calculate many, many MAC operations uh, to compute a single result. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the popular ResNet 50 model uh, requires 3.9 billion MAC operations. So you need a lot of computation to make these things work. We'll be talking a lot about two different modes of uh, neural network operation over the next two days. Um, uh, first, a neural network has to be trained to recognize a particular uh, type of uh, data. Uh, for example, if you're looking for pictures of cats, you train it to, uh, with pictures of cats. And then once uh, you've trained the neural network, you've, you've uh, computed the value, uh, the weighting value of each of these connections in the network, then you can use that network uh, to uh, do what's called inference, meaning that you analyze uh, a bunch of data and then you compute the results. So is this a cat, is it not a cat? So that's the basic process of using uh, a neural network, training and then inference. Now, in order to compute the values uh, in the neural network, uh, you have to do all these MAC operations. Now, uh, the first thing uh, people try to do is uh, do these operations in parallel. So uh, you take like a SIMD architecture, and you can crank through, uh, for example, 64 MAC operations in parallel uh, in, uh, in an Intel processor. But then uh, you're only going to get a fraction of a teraflop uh, typically, you know, from that kind of arrangement. Uh, and the bottleneck here uh, starts to become uh, the register file. Uh, every time you do these MAC operations, even if it's 64 at a time, uh, you have to compute the results, uh, load them back into the register file, then bring them back into the MAC units for the next round of computation. So uh, this has a lot of overhead. What we're seeing today is uh, more uh, use of something called a systolic array. So as the picture shows, now I've got a bunch of MAC units which are all interconnected so that once you compute a result, it immediately flows into the next uh, MAC unit to uh, compute the next operation. Uh, this uh, breaks the register file bottleneck and creates this kind of data flow structure where uh, you can easily compute a sum of several multiplications, which is fundamental operation to compute a matrix multiply. Uh, if you set this up properly, you take the weight values uh, that I talked about earlier, and you can broadcast them across the array so that they're uh, reused uh, in multiple calculations. And then uh, the activation data flows down from the top. You can uh, reduce the power by an order of magnitude uh, with this type of arrangement you know, compared to the SIMD type processor that you saw previously. So, uh, so this is a big advance. Uh, it's being uh, used in a lot of different chips uh, today. And um, it's also very scalable, which is, is nice. You can scale it down to a small array for uh, a lower power operation, or you can scale it up to a very large array with thousands of MAC units if you, uh, if you need to maximize uh, your compute performance. Now, another advance that uh, people are, are using today uh, is uh, called sparse computing. Uh, what uh, uh, researchers have realized is that um, when you build the neural network, um, you may have many weights in that network that are fairly small or close to zero um, or even zero. And as, uh, as values are computed in the network, um, even uh, if the weights aren't zero, the node output may be 
pretty small, pretty close to zero. And if you multiply anything by something close to zero, you're going to get a very small value that's not really going to change the value of the accumulator. So why even bother? In hardware, you can look for these uh, values and uh, simply say, OK, well, if I see a value of zero, I'm not going to do the multiply. I don't power the MAC unit for that cycle. Uh, you know, you can definitely save some power that way. But we're actually seeing uh, chip designs that um, can look at the data coming in and kind of rearrange it in a way to get rid of these zero values so they never even feed into the MAC units. And if you can do that, then you can actually focus all of your MAC operations on doing something more useful than multiplying by zero, and um, you can improve your performance. In some cases, by 2x, 3x, 4x even, depending on how sparse your network is. This is definitely an advantage, uh, particularly for certain networks that tend to have a lot of zero values. Um, you know, one, one problem is how, how do you compute performance? Uh, some vendors are trying to uh, say, well, I didn't do this MAC because it had a zero, but I'm still going to count that as a MAC operation. Uh, I'm not really excited about that because um, uh, you're not really doing anything, but it does basically improve the efficiency of your chip because you're not doing useless operations. So um, no matter how you count your ops, you're still going to have a better performance uh, in your neural network. So, um, so this is uh, something that is being implemented in more uh, accelerators these days, and I think it's a, it's a good advance. Now, data types are pretty important, um, and there's been a lot of research and experimentation uh, with different kinds of data. Now, initially, most of the neural network uh, efforts were done with floating point values. That gives you a lot of range to cover very small values, very big values. Um, and during training, you don't really know where these weights are going to go. So uh, being able to cover this big range is important. Um, but once you've computed the results, um, and you're preparing to deploy the network in an inference mode, um, you already know then at that point what the weight values are, and you can generally encode them more efficiently in integer format. And integer format is easier to deal with in hardware than floating point, so you're going to save some power that way. And then people are looking at, um, well, how many bits do you really need uh, in these integers? You know, let's start with 32, but it turns out that that's, that's really more than you need. So people started trying 16, and then people started trying 8. And it seems like 8-bit integers actually work pretty well, even though you only have 256 values uh, to look at. Neural networks really don't need that much precision. They're kind of designed to deal with the, you know, gray, colors of gray. So. Um, so the, uh, a lot of the work today on inference is being done in 8-bit integers. Now, on the, on the training side, um, floating point is still uh, really the, the uh, format of choice. Um, but there have been some uh, research into some, some new floating point formats. Google has come up with something called bfloat16, which is uh, obviously a 16-bit format, but it retains all of the range of a uh, 32-bit floating point value. So uh, you lose some of the, the precision, but again, because neural networks are designed to work in a less precise manner, um, the precision's not as important. So, uh, so Google's very uh, uh, sold on this bfloat16. Intel's adopted it uh, for all of its processors uh, going forward, and so we expect to see more use of bfloat16 uh, on the training side and then int 8 or even smaller integers potentially on the inference side. Um, you need uh, so to do a lot of MAC operations, but you also need to do some other kinds of calculations to uh, uh, calculate or inference a neural network. Um, one of the functions that is you know, fairly unique to uh, neural networks are these activation functions that are applied after a node uh, or a layer has been uh, calculated. Um, and as you can see, these, these are uh, some complex math functions like the sigmoid function or the hyperbolic tangent function. And these are fairly difficult to compute on a standard processor. So putting custom hardware 
into your neural network accelerator to compute these uh, operations is uh, a good way to reduce power and accelerate the performance of a neural network. So, so building a, a deep learning accelerator it isn't just about putting a bunch of MAC units together, but also having uh, special uh, instructions or special hardware to handle some of these activation functions, to handle normalization and pooling layers, uh, which require different operations. So you still need to have um, you know, a comprehensive solution in order to fully accelerate a, a neural network inference or retraining calculation. And then don't forget about the memory. Um, once you build these uh, engines that can compute, you know, tera uh, max per second, um, you need to feed the data into these engines to keep them running efficiently. Um, now, uh, in order to uh, feed uh, that much data, um, you need to use on-chip memory to start. And so, particularly if you can take the weight values, which uh, are constant, uh, you can store those on chip. That's a big plus. Um, you know, typically you're talking about megabytes of uh, weight values uh, for, a, for a neural network. And then uh, the streaming uh, activation data typically comes uh, from external memory. So now you need a high bandwidth external memory system, um, uh, particularly in data center class uh, accelerators. Uh, you need very high bandwidth memory. Um, multi-channel DRAM or high bandwidth type uh, DRAM memories to, um, to do that. And you probably don't want to have caches in the way. Uh, this, this, uh, the activation data uh, is uh, streaming. It doesn't repeat very much. So caches just tend to, uh, to get in the way and, um, and don't really work very well. So, um, so it's really a different design than you would typically use to run uh, you know, general purpose type uh, programming or uh, graphics programming. Now, one way to uh, break this uh, memory bandwidth bottleneck is to actually do uh, the computation in the memory itself. Um, and this is called in-memory compute. And one of the, uh, the ways uh, that's uh, promising is, uh, is, is actually to do the computation in analog format. Um, so uh, the diagram here shows a, um, you know, some kind of flash memory or phase change memory where uh, instead of just storing a zero or a one value in each memory cell, uh, you actually store some type of analog value. So for example, if you uh, uh, program the cell and vary the resistance you know, between uh, you know, zero and 255, you can store 256 different uh, uh, resistance or conductance levels uh, within each cell. And then in order to do uh, analog multiplication, you just use Ohm's law, and you run a, a voltage through there, and you can calculate the output um, and uh, uh, then convert it back to a digital format. And then you can actually uh, do the same thing through multiple cells at once, and the currents will add uh, using Kirchhoff's law, and then uh, you, you basically have a multiply accumulate operation performed in the memory system using only analog values, and you can reduce uh, the power by you know, 20x or more uh, by using this analog computation rather than digital. So there's several companies looking into this, um, and uh, it looks very promising. Uh, so far, the bigger, biggest issue has been uh, in manufacturing, trying to make this work uh, you know, not just on one cell or one chip, but across you know, thousands or millions of chips uh, being manufactured on a standard production line. So if they can solve that problem, um, you know, this, this could be a very promising uh, technique. Another new technique that's being researched uh, is called spiking neural networks. Uh, and, uh, this is a subset of uh, what's called neuromorphic computing, um, which is trying to you know, more closely emulate the brain function um, using the, the type of uh, methods that, that uh, are actually used in the brain. So uh, the difference here uh, versus the, the deep neural networks that I've been talking about are that uh, you're not using MAC operations. Um, the the uh, activation values are very binary. Uh, you can just use simple counters 
to decide what the uh, neuron values are going to, to do, and, uh, and thus the power consumption becomes much lower. Um, the, the problem is that so far, uh, this type of spiking neural network doesn't really scale well up into some of the, the larger problems that people are trying to solve, but it does seem to uh, work uh, very efficiently uh, to do more simple image recognition or, or simpler neural networks uh, that don't have a lot of neurons. So, um, you know, this may uh, be uh, a type of technology that can be used in, in certain applications uh, and not necessarily displace deep neural networks. But, uh, you know, we see some interest from companies like uh, Intel and IBM, as well as startups like Brainchip uh, in uh, this kind of technology and uh, trying to bring it to market. 